So uh, that moves us to a conversation with uh, Mr. Jay Nichols, the Vermont Principals Association. Uh, Mr. Nichols, thanks for being with us. We really would like to talk to you about two things. Um, you know that we have a bill before us uh, that was introduced, I believe, by Senator McCormick last year having to do with mascots uh, throughout the state. And that issue is on the table. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask Jim Demaray if he's there um, when we get started, just to uh, kind of give us the, the, a quick overview of that bill, just to remind us. And then we'd like to talk to you a little bit about school culture, specifically related to athletics. Uh, and I believe that was in the email also. There are a number of disturbing things in the press over the past, you know, between when we, I think, recessed and now. Um, and uh, we'd like to know how the Vermont Principals Association is, is working on those issues. Um, is there something that you need from us, um, et cetera. So with that, uh, Mr. Demery, would you just tell us over the overview of Senator McCormick's bill and how it, how it would work? Yeah, sure. So uh, for the record, uh, Jim Demery, the council, uh, this bill is S139. And um, what it does is it would prohibit schools from essentially having mascots or other symbols or images that depict or refer to a racial or ethnic group, individual, custom, or tradition. Um, so that's the prohibition. Uh, it would be three years uh, in terms of coming into compliance. And it only applies to public schools. Um, and failure to comp comply after three years would render the public school ineligible to compete in Vermont Principals Association's sanctions, sanctioned events. So athletic events. Um, and that's basically the bill. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Mr. Nichols, the floor is yours. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon. And thanks, Jim, for giving the overview of the bill. For the record, uh, Jay Nichols, Executive Director of the Vermont Principals Association. I'll touch on the bill a little bit and then to the questions that Senator Campion outlined at the beginning of this. <clears throat> of this session. So first of all, as a preface to my testimony today, I wanna to remind the committee that the VPA has leaned heavily into the issue around racist symbols and mascots in schools. We provided a press statement that has been utilized in a number of school board discussions across the state and has helped lead to the change in names of some mascots. Further, <clears throat> we have taken strong steps, excuse me. <clears throat> Further, we have taken strong steps to educate the public student athletes, spectators, coaches, officials, and site administrators as to how best to address behavior at school events. I'll provide a little testimony on, on these two issues and then gladly answer any questions you might have. So first of all, S-139. Um, we appreciate the sentiment of Senator McCormick's bill as well as the health bill with the same language. And we stand by our statement, which I'm going to quickly read to you. And this was on October, August 28th that we put this out of 2020. In support of the BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color students and families and other historically marginalized peoples, the VPA's Executive Council, Council issues the following statement regarding school mascots. School mascots are often powerful symbols within a community. We believe that mascots and all school symbols should support feelings of belonging and inclusivity for students and the wider community. They should not perpetuate divisive stereotypes and contribute to the ongoing marginalization, erasure, and harm to BIPOC communities. Any mascot, nickname, symbol, or logo that has marginalizing, racist, or exclusionary elements should be replaced to demonstrate what it means to be inclusive, welcoming, and strong community. Just as all aspects of school operations need ongoing improvement for equitable outcomes and inclusive representation of policies, and policies, so too should school mascots. Now that said, <clears throat> on the testimony, although we agree with the sentiment of the bill, we have two concerns as articulated by our executive council after a meeting last Friday on January 21st, 2022. First, we don't believe that legislating from Montpelier is the best way to deal with this issue. We believe it's important for schools and communities to have these conversations together and try to reach a mutually agreed upon solution. Should the legislature determine that this issue rises to a level of compelling state interest, we would certainly understand that, 
but we would worry about this potentially being a legislative overstep. Secondly, the last sentence in the bill states a provision that we vehemently are opposed to. The bill states, any public school not in compliance three years after passage of this act shall be ineligible to compete in Vermont Principals Association sanctioned events. The Vermont Principals Association is a private member driven organization. As such, the VPA is not under the direction of the legislature in terms of VPA rules and regulations. And more importantly to us, we would worry about a small group of adults, example given board members, making the decision to keep an inappropriate mascot, requiring ultimately the punishment of school athletes from that school by, not, by denying participation of VPA sanctioned events. Um, that's my testimony on the mascot piece. Would you like me to go into the behavior piece or would you like to break them up? If it's okay with you, let's break them up. Uh, let's right. stick with this for now. Uh, committee, uh, questions or comments at this point? Senator Perslick. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Nichols, you, has the Principals Association looked at all the mascots? Like, have you done a, a scan and said, well, you know, made a made a determination if they are violating the principle that you you read the statement? And if so, yeah. like, are there any mascots out there that would be in violation of the of the association's statement? Yes, there are there are some that are in violation of the statement. However, the statement is not a directive, nor do we have the authority as an organization to tell schools at a local level uh, what they can do in relationship to a mascot. And the example I would give you would be um, the whole masking issue. We've been get, putting out guidance that uh, on the masking issue and on COVID and return to play that's been sent to us from the Department of Health. And all of those things are recommendations. So we're not allowed to even say to schools, you must have every kid wear a mask to play sports. If the local school district says, we're not gonna do that for our home games, we have no legal authority to stand on. Fortunately, schools have been, for the most part, really good about that. It's the same thing here. The VPA does, doesn't have any authority to tell a school what their mascot or their team name means to be. What we can do is use the bully pulpit, and we have, to say to people that we think those uh, anything has racist uh, symbol, symbolism or a mascot that's not inclusive of all students in your school should be revisited and should be changed. And we've had that conversation um, in several schools where changes have been made that you've read about in the media. And in one school in particular where a change was made and then was made back by the board to the previous, um, what we believe to be racist mascot. I wasn't clear on one part, part of your answer. So does the association think that there are current mascots that don't meet that, that standard that, that do yes. have? Okay. Do you know how yes. many? Do you know how many? I don't know. I don't know how many. Um, we've never really done a scan of it. And what's interesting is that a lot depends on the, the where the mascot came from. So for example, not trying to throw any schools under the bus or anything, but Leland and Gray has a mascot that's that's um, the Patriots. I think it's called the Patriots or the Rebels, one or the other. But whatever it is, it's about the Revolutionary War and all their imagery is around the Revolutionary War and rebelling against uh, the British and American independence. There's another school, so it was the rebels. That must be the rebels. There's another school, South Burlington, as you know, where I used to be a principal that went through the same thing. And that clearly was more about South seceding from the North, South Burlington seceding from Burlington, and was you know, a, more of a Confederate type connection. And so those two things we would say are both different. That's kind of why we think that uh, local committees, uh, communities need to have those discussions themselves and make the decision that they think is best for their communities. Now, I want to be really clear. There's a couple names that we think are really problematic, and everybody on the executive council think that they're wrong. We just don't know if it should be legislated. We're not obviously not going to fight against it, but we think we, it would be better off if it was done at the local level. There's just a one follow-up, Chair. It would be interesting to see that list, what mascots that the school, the principal's association feels is a problematic. We could, I could talk to Bob Johnson in my office and we could actually get the names of all the mascots for high school sports in the state and share that with you. I mean, I can think of two or three off the top of my head right now. That right. I don't, you know, I don't want all of them for all the state. I want the ones that the school association, the principal association has <laughs> thinks are problematic. Okay, we could do that. And I'm going to couch it as we, we think might be problematic. Again, sure. we want to know the historical underpinnings of it. Sure. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.
Senator Hooker. Thank you. Um, Jay, you talked about um, wanting the communities to make this decision, but you also talked about a small group of adults perhaps making the decision, which I think is the case in my community. Um, does the Principals Association have any recommendations on what this community should look like? Yeah, that's a great question. And I know I've, I've talked to the, the superintendent in your community about this, um, as well as the principals in your community. And I know it's a real tough situation. Um, we worked a couple of years ago with a guy by the name of Paul Gorski. We brought him into Vermont and he did a lot of work on what inclusion really means. And he worked with several communities, but I, I really, I don't have, we don't have a specific recommendation on who could help them have those conversations, but I think that's what it's going to come down to. Uh, and I just, I personally really worry about state overreach. And I think over the last five years, uh, maybe our executive council has listened too much to me because I was kind of surprised when we, when we kind of fell this way that we thought this might be overstep because everybody there is completely against mascots that are not inclusive. However, they really balked at the idea of it being legislated. That's really the big question for us, Senator Hooker. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm on the, my God, it's 2022. What if people aren't taking this up? I worry about, how, you know, marginalized communities, as I know you are as well. But, uh, I, yeah, I, 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 I am, I, I'm feeling like time's up, folks. Uh, but, yeah, we can have this conversation. Please, Senator Chinden. Jay, thank you. And uh, I, I don't know when you were in South Burlington, but I know that I was on the city council during the rebel debate and that was uh, that tore our community apart. I don't need to, to bring up all the specifics, but it was it was the worst I've seen it at a, at a really local level. So I'm, I'm I would love to probe your testimony as to why you would think that it, we couldn't help um, from the legislative point of view in giving shelter and guiding these conversations so as to shield our local school board members and principals from having to have this this debate with such thorny issues where there isn't necessarily a right or a wrong. Uh, you, you mentioned the rebel uh, con conversation and how that term, I, I support removing the rebel, but I guess my question to you is, I thought you would have come out with the uh, concerns about the language as how it wouldn't really address that, that conflict. As I read this bill, I didn't see how it would actually help a school board uh, steer away from that rebel debate because the, the, the term rebel is debatable into its racist roots. Um, so my, my question is, uh, putting aside the fact that you you're concerned that it might be a state overreach, do you have any thoughts on how this language could in fact help um, shelter our local school boards and our principals association so that they don't have to be the ones that are carrying the flag on addressing this issue and instead the legislature could step in like the chair was just speaking to? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point, Senator Chin, and that conversation actually did come up on Friday, and we had several members that were there. We had 12 of our, 12 of our, we have 50 member board. We had 12 people that were there. Ironically enough, we had three not there because of COVID issues covering in their schools, um, which I'm, I'm sure you're surprised by. In any case, the, the idea came up of if the state just did this, it would be a lot easier for principals and school boards. So that was a discussion that was brought up. And I think that's one of the, reason why, one of the reasons why my testimony on the first part of that bill, I mentioned compelling state interests. And I think you folks get paid the big bucks to make that determination. You know, so it certainly would make it easier for individual principals and school board members if the decision was out of their hands. We just think from a from a more of a core value point that to the degree possible, we'd like to see decisions made at the local level. But again, we're not going to stand and, and argue against that. And, and we understand the rationale behind it fully. Our bigger issue would be yeah, not Senator holding Chin. kids accountable. We get paid big bucks. This is news to me. So, um, <laughs> not if you're new to the committee, it's if you've been there for a while. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, this bill, and I, I may have misunderstood, but this is basically saying it's not necessarily, it's, it's saying you've got three years, correct? Yeah. To, yep. to, to, to handle it locally. So, it is, it's just for those communities that want to say, hey, maybe next year, maybe next year, maybe next year, it's saying this is the time. So uh, so in a way, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's it's just putting some pressure on, lo on local school boards saying, okay, time's up, but we're, we're giving you still a little extra time. 
to your point, sometimes it can be very helpful to have these conversations locally. They can be learning experiences. People come in, young people who might be thinking, hey, this isn't a problem, then hear directly from somebody who is of Native American ancestry or a member of the BIPOC community. And it's, it's, a, it's a real, again, sort of John Dewey learning by doing and experiencing. So it seems like it's, it's balanced in that way. Yeah, I don't have a, uh, any argument with that at all. Okay. The only argument I would have is I would not want any school that didn't follow through on this to have their kids deprived of extracurricular activities that we sanction. That would be the biggest issue. So on the first part of this, sure, uh, we, we'd be okay with that. Yeah, so you're okay with us saying, okay, folks, next two years, let's say, have the conversation. Uh, if you don't, then, okay, maybe you, you know, the state, the legislature says, you know, I, I don't know what our thing is, you know, you don't have a mascot or, or whatever, uh, but really forcing that conversation, um, or we could make up a mascot, you know, that they would have to, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know, uh, but it, it would be something in some way that would get them to do it. Yes, I, I think our committee would be okay with that. Okay. Again, we'd rather see it done at the local level, and we just don't want them to be we don't want the kids to get hurt out of this. Well, that's my them. point. I mean, it, we were giving you two years for the local community to do it. Three, you said earlier. Yeah, I know. I'm playing with the numbers. I know. I, I was hoping you were more forgetful because you're running a fever. But as usual, you're right on your game here. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Let's just say two to three years. Um, three seems like a long time, given everything. But yeah, yeah. and that's something that the committee, you know, uh, it just, again, says, and, and I don't know what the, the correct repercussions are, you know, if people don't, but it does seem to me that some pressure on the local community to start to do this, to have the conversation locally sounds like a good balance. Senator Lyons. Whoops, whoops. Uh, you just um, made the suggestion I was going to make, and that is, let's, you know, let's get the local conversation going. Let's not let it last any longer. I also remember when the Crusaders at Champlain Valley Union were converted over to the Red Hawks. And that was, that was also an interesting conversation. And there were some of us, and not some of us, there were some who thought that Cow Valley Union should be converted to, to uh, the local dairy vernacular. It didn't happen, which was a good thing. But there were a lot of there were a lot of there were a lot of fun things that happened during that discussion, as well as the very serious. Wouldn't it be nice if that could happen with other schools? So, yeah. uh, I do have a question. Do you really have a fever? I'm a little under the weather, but I took a COVID test and I came back negative. Oh, good. Um, that's why I'm okay. working from home today. I don't I don't feel too good, but all right. I'm always here for Senate Ed. I'm sorry that you're not feeling well. Oh, thank you. But is there is there a possibility that if the schools didn't make a decision that another entity could do that for them short of the legislature? So the <clears throat> state board, the Vermont Principals Association, a coalition of folks. Um, I don't know how. Not that I'm aware of, happen. Senator. OK. It's a great question, though. You know, again, you don't want to punish kids because if adults, you know, aren't like you're saying, uh, going to make, you know, the decisions that need to be made. But what it would be great if you would give some thought, Mr. Nichols, to what happens if in a couple of years we don't, or we, or we just do this under a tighter frame time frame. Uh, just give that some thought. That would that would be great. Okay. Uh, would you like me to share on this, the uh, behavioral piece now? Uh, I'm just looking to see if there are any other questions or comments related to this. So it sounds like we, we will move forward with this in some way, uh, but um, rethinking perhaps, uh, although not having pulled the committee officially, we might rethink the, uh, the athletic suspension piece. Okay, uh, yes, uh, speaking of athletics, the floor is yours again. Okay, so uh, in terms of behavior at athletic events, it's important to recognize, and I know you all know this, that schools are a microcosm of society itself. So just as with racism, if there's inappropriate conduct in society at large, there's going to be some inappropriate behavior in schools and at extracurricular events. This fall, we had several high-profile events that in a couple of cases also involved alleged and substantiated allegations of racist behavior. 
This led the VPA to take several actions. First of all, with the support of our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee and the Approval of our Activity Standards Committee, working in conjunction with the athletic directors in the state, we drafted an announcement to be read prior to school sporting events beginning in the winter season. That statement is attached with this testimony. Um, if you'd like me to, I could read it to you. It's about a page. Like maybe some highlights, parts of it, sure. Um, sure, basically what it says is, um, in my own words, when you come to an event at our school and it mentions the school name and the other school that's visiting, we expect all behavior to be appropriate. There's no racist behavior. It mentions uh, uh, certain categories. And it makes the point that if fan conduct is not the way it's supposed to be, that the game can be stopped by the coaches, the officials, and the site administrator. And it can be dealt with in a variety of ways, one of which is to send everybody out and to have the kids play without any fans there. Another one is to reschedule the game or, or stop the game right there at that time and let the VPA decide what's going to happen with the game. So there's a lot of opportunities there that officials in the past haven't really known what to do. You know, um, as, a, as a baseball umpire at the high school and college level, you know, I've thrown parents out of a game before for inappropriate behavior. But if you had a bunch of people heckling a kid, <clears throat> a lot of umpires wouldn't know what to do. Um, and we're saying, you know, if it's, if it's to the point where it's really inappropriate, you can stop the game. And so can the coaches along with the site administrator. So we're trying to put more tools in the toolbox for the people that are actually hosting the event. Along with that, we've also implemented uh, required implicit bias training for high school officials. And we'd already done that for coaches, but now we've added high school officials to it. So it's our understanding that we are the only sports association at the state level in the United States that has made this a requirement. And through our partnerships with the Center for Creative Leadership in North Carolina, which the BPA partners with on a lot of things, and the National Federation of High Schools, we've been able to provide these trainings at no cost to the officials themselves. Um, and that was important to us because our officials are not really paid a lot and it's very hard to get people to, to officiate. Additionally, we've added a third party investigation option so to, should a situation occur at an event in which two schools are involved and they can't come to agreement on what occurred, with concurrence from the two school districts, the VPA will assign a third-party investigator who investigates the incident, develops a report with findings of fact and recommendations for the two school districts as well as the VPA. And then finally, we have implemented, implemented an online live link on our website that allows anyone to report a concern to the VPA that occurs at any event that we sanction. It's very simple form, um, and I've uh, Daphne has a copy of the form, a PDF of the form that I sent to her that she can look at. And, and kids are using it, and adults are using it. We, we've had a number of cases from the fall and early this winter where people are sharing that information. And then in terms of how it's gone so far this winter, uh, as always, we've had our issues. In one case, we had a parent arrested and removed by police in handcuffs because he refused to wear a mask at a junior varsity basketball game. I wish I could say I was making that up, but I'm not. Um, however, that issue and others have been handled mostly at the local level. Athletic directors and coaches have both said that reading the statement and being able to refer back to it has made people realize that they're willing to pause or even cancel a game if necessary and take appropriate action to keep kids safe and to make sure the event can occur in an appropriate way. And I could say a lot more on this subject, but I think at this point it might be better just to let the committee ask any questions that you might have regarding this. I just have one quick question. Uh, how is this being communicated to parents? Uh, and I may have missed that, but you know. Yeah, there's a, a statement. I mean, this is, come on, this is like ridiculous. So how do you yeah. read that parent that says, hey, before you go to the game uh, or match or whatever, read this or just remember uh, to kind of tone it down a bit. And yeah, our hope. What's going on there? Yeah. Yeah. Our hope is that by reading it at every event, having the schools read it at every event, and you know, hopefully every school is doing this. I've been to several events this, this uh, late fall when we put this in place, and this winter, and I've heard it read every place I've been to. Now, maybe people are seeing me walk in the room, and so they're in the gym, so they're reading it. But I've heard other people say that it's, that it's being read as well. And I sent along with the testimony the copy of what's supposed to be read. Schools are allowed to adjust it a little bit to make it a little bit shorter. And schools have come up with some creative ideas of doing it. For example, I was at a basketball game last night where the captains of the home team, boys and girls, actually had a uh, recording of them reading the statement. Powerful. 
when it's yeah. kids yeah. saying it, you yeah. know, and yeah. this school did it that yeah. way because they didn't want to not, the kids have to do it live every time. But we've seen other schools. I know at Burr and Burr, and they've had captains of their of their teams actually read the statement because Dave Maselli's you know worked a lot with us on this, and he's the AD there. And up north here where I live, different ADs have done it in different ways. Sometimes it's a kid reading it. Sometimes it's an announcer. Sometimes it's a captain of a team. Usually they'll do it uh, right before the national anthem. So I, I think it's had impact. Uh, we certainly have seen coaches have said that they think it has impact. Is it, is it going to solve all problems? No, but at least it gives people the, the fair warning that this is a high school event. Act appropriately. And if you don't, you're not going to be able to stay here. Personally, yeah, thanks, and thanks, Jay. Because I, I was um, concerned when the media, and I know I don't know if you felt VPA was treated fairly, but I, I don't think it came off well in the media stories on on how things were handled. And my experience at middle school basketball games is that the fans and parents are pretty horrible. And I, one thing that you said stuck out to me, you said, like, if there's heckling of a, of a player to the point that it's inappropriate, something can be done. But I'd say any heckling of a player from a fan should be inappropriate and the game should be stopped. And I, I, don't, I will look at the statement uh, that, you, in your, that you gave us with your testimony, but I think one of the concerns that are the stopping the game doesn't really – stop the bad behavior like i think and then maybe, maybe you can clarify this that not only should they be able to stop at the game but they should be able to declare a winner if if one side is heckling the players uh then the ref or others should be able to say okay that side forfeits and you lost the game because that's what they care about uh you know ending right. the game and rescheduling it you know they might think that's a win and so i think it needs to be Point. And that's that's the kind of with a mascot there has to be some kind of consequences yeah i've seen refs try to stop you know and i've seen parents get thrown out i've seen this the the bus driver of the of the team get thrown out of the game and but it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference because i think there's a general culture that it's acceptable to heckle players and heckle the refs and i wouldn't yeah. be a ref in any, any of those games precisely because i don't think they're protected. Yeah. So um, just to respond to that quickly, if, when you read that, you'll see that there is a part in there that the game could be forfeited. And what we do is we have the coaches and the site administrators get together and make a decision on how they want to proceed. And it could be announcement. And part of this is the culture that we live in, right? So it's not uncommon when, I'll give you an example. The game I went to last night, when a kid on one of the teams traveled a bunch of fans on the other team, kids, kids on the other team, uh, started singing, you can't do that. And I don't know if we should be in the position of trying to police that stuff. Um, I, I'm really trying to draw the line at the stuff that's really inappropriate because you know, it's just kids. They're being playing kids. basketball and they travel. Yeah. So, the, you know, so the kid traveled on the other team, you can't do that. Show and up. when a kid, a coach calls a timeout, a lot of times the other team will yell back, um, talk it over and they'll sing you know, to me, that stuff is just part of the game. And I don't, I don't think we're ever going to get, get rid of that. What I have a problem with is when somebody's using racist language or swearing at a kid or at an official, and in those situations, people need to be um, removed. The other thing is you mentioned about the VPA not uh, coming off too well. The, the reality of the situation, the big situation that took place is that the VPA found out it was an issue well after it occurred and it wasn't reported to us. And so we were playing catch up on, on, on the whole situation. If you're referring to the soccer game that, that brought a lot of this into the, into the light. And so we've tried to respond to that by working with superintendents, athletic directors, principals, and a little bit with the school boards association, but not a lot to try to make sure that everybody had input on the direction that we were going to take. And so what the testimony today is about is a response to that. And that doesn't mean it can't be strengthened or tightened it up depending on how things go. I was talking to, um, the New York executive director a few days ago and telling him about some of the things that we dealt with. And he said, you guys have no clue. <laughs> he says, uh, you know, Vermont, you have no clue. We deal with this. We deal with racial stuff every single day, repeatedly. Uh, and, you know, it's very, very tough to police. So we are fortunate where we are, but we do take it seriously and we're willing to take any action we need to, to make sure that, a, that the playing environment for kids is fun, um, but also safe. 
Yeah, Senator Persley. Yeah, I, I wondered if you had ever been to an ultimate competitive ultimate Frisbee game. I've only been to one. It wasn't a playoff game. And I went because once we sanctioned it, um, the year that it became a varsity sport was my first year as executive director. And I was in the office, old baseball coach, old basketball coach. And I made a comment to um, Bob Johnson about it saying, wow, because I don't know if you saw this, but Saturday Night Live took a shot at us, probably an ultimate Frisbee. I don't know if you guys saw that skit or not, but they, no. they picked on the VPA, picked on Vermont for having ultimate Frisbee for sport. Huh. So I said something to Bob about, well, now we have Frisbee for sport. And Bob said, you cannot call it Frisbee. You have to call it ultimate and you need to go to a game. So I did go to a game and it's pretty amazing. The kids call the, they call the fouls themselves and all that stuff. So yeah, it's interesting. I, I think it's a, an excellent, excellent example of sportsmanship being yeah. as important as, as the game. So yeah, it's something that is an example of how, how competitive sports can be played without that heckling of the refs, so they don't even have refs, so they don't heckle the, the players. Right. Not only right. it was, I just also want to say it wasn't just the soccer game. It was a, there was a, a woman's, maybe it was soccer too, but maybe it was lacrosse or something where there was also just sexist comments or comments directed at specific players. Yeah. That, that was an issue too. And that's the kind of stuff that I saw at the, at the women's basketball games that I was going to where, you know, I agree with you just, you know, chanting for the team and, and that kind of thing is, is okay. Even if it's about something that a specific person did, but I, it's any kind of heckling to a specific person or really berating the, the rest yeah. is, I don't think that, I think there should be a zero tolerance for it. Yeah. And there's supposed to be one of the hard parts is you usually have one side administrator there. Uh, for example, last night at the basketball game that I went to, and I won't mention the school, the AD, who's a pretty new AD, I think he's in his third year. He's really, I think he's really good. He um, thought that the kids were getting a little bit too rambunctious. It was a really close game. And he went up and he sat in the stands with the kids. But there was this one guy sitting not too far from me that several times made inappropriate comments about the refs, but he also didn't yell them out. It was like he was sitting with his, his group of people and was like, oh, this refs, every freaking calls against us, rah, rah, rah. But he, but he wasn't screaming at the referees. And the, and the referees, I don't think he even heard a single thing he said. So it's, it's tough. I mean, we are a very big sports culture. I used to say as a superintendent that if I said we we're going to cancel varsity basketball this year, I'd have hundreds of parents there ready to lynch me. But if I said we're going to cancel algebra, people would be like, well, yeah, I guess that's okay. You know, it's uh, that's part of the society that we live in, yeah. unfortunately. Mr. Nichols, help us understand, where does the buck stop during a basketball game? You know, where, just so I know, so... You've got the AD, you've got the ref. Who's going to who's gonna be the one that would ultimately say, okay, enough's enough. This game is over, and uh, this, this group won, this team won. Well, ultimately, what would happen in that situation would, would be that the site administrator would stop the game. And then so he me, would meet here. Site administrator for me. Oh, usually it's the athletic director, but sometimes it's the principal okay. or the assistant principal. So whoever, so whoever in the hierarchy is, is there at the highest, okay. Right. But they can't make a decision on whether the game is forfeit or not because they're obviously on one side or the other. Right. So what they would do is they would meet with the coaches mm -hmm. and meet with the um, referees and together they'd make a decision on how they want to handle it. And if the decision was to stop the game right there and not complete the game, then it would come to us and they would share the information with us and we would decide, is it a forfeit? Was there culpability on both sides? So we're just going to play the game again or play it from that point without fans or something along those lines. So we wouldn't put a site administrator in a position where they could say, okay, we, now the game's a forfeit. Your team loses, our team wins. Because that, be, that would be asking for a really tough situation. We would say site administrator with the coaches and the um, AD, similar to what Burlington and South Burlington did. They stopped the game, sent everybody home. It was a volleyball game. And that was in a direct response to information that we gave them on how they should handle that. And one of the teams did end up forfeiting that game because they said we were largely responsible. So we're, we'll take the forfeit. We didn't have to intervene. They said, we'll take the forfeit. So before I uh, move to center lines, who, who made the decision for the game to be over and send everybody home again, the highest side administrator there. Okay. Yeah. The difference in that one though, was that they both were there Okay. because it was two schools in Chittenden County, both ADs happened to be at the event, but yeah, it would be the site administrator would make the decision to say, that's it. Everybody's going home. Okay. Center lines. Okay, 
that was a struggle just to get unmuted. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, this has been, this is a great conversation. And obviously there are some sports where we see more of the harassment going on than others. And I don't know how to learn from those sports where it doesn't happen as much. Um, I think of tennis that is, <laughs> grew up in a, tennis grew up in a, such a polite society, but you know, do we still see that uh, on the side? Do we still see discriminatory comments on the on the sidelines? I, I don't know. And what at what? How many kids are involved in working with you? Do you have sort of a cohort of uh, students learning about these issues and trying to help out within their own local? Great institutions, uh, you know, it just seems to me that kids can corral kids so much better than we adults. Yeah, yeah that's a great question. So the Vermont um, Athletic Directors Association, they actually have a conference, a leadership conference of kids, and we help sponsor them and we help provide them with training and stuff that that group does a lot with student development. And that's been something they've been doing for a long time. I can remember back when I first was a young high school coach that we had a couple of kids every year that got selected to go to this conference um, for athletic leadership. And they've been doing that for a long time. So it's done at the local level. Um, there's a lot, a lot of schools that participate. And I think most high schools have kids that participate in that and, and have that development. Usually you have to be a, a member of a sports team and a captain uh, and somebody who's interested in leadership and they, they provide them with training. And I, to my knowledge, I think every school does something like that different in every school, but they all do something like that. I think that's really helpful. And, but also moving into the groups of kids who are not uh, in, the, in any of the games, sometimes it's that those groups that are, or they're, they're watching their friends and they, they get frenzied, you know, they're the, oftentimes yeah. that is the case actually. Know, like, or <laughs> former students. We've had a yeah. lot of issues over the year with kids who you know, are 21, 22, 23 years old that are at a game that are just acting, um, you know, completely inappropriate. And it's really hard on the school, especially if they find out what somebody did a day later when the kid doesn't even go to their school, they can issue a no trespass, you know? Oh. Um, and also our, direct, our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee at the VPA with VSADA has uh, students on it. So we're definitely trying to get student voice where we can. Interpersonal. I'm sorry, Senator Lyons. No, I was just going to say it sounds like there's so much going on. Um, it sounds. It, it, thank you. That's all. Senator Persley. Yeah, it's good to hear you're getting the student voices in it. My last question was on the uh, form that you have for people reporting, which I think is a good first step. It, what happens if you know, who's reading those? What happens when you get a report? Can you just go through the, the process? Yeah. It's reported. Yeah. So any report that we get, <clears throat> we make sure it goes to the two athletic directors and the two athletic directors talk to each other and they try to resolve it that way. And they let us know if they need our help with it. One of the things about the VPA, and, and I tell people this all the time, people look at me like I'm crazy. VPA only has five employees for the whole state. Um, and we're one of five organizations in the United States that oversees sports as well as you know, the legislative work, the legal work, if a principal is in legal trouble or there's an employment issue, they come to me. So we only, have, we only have five employees. So for us to get involved, it's usually on the really big stuff when the schools ask us to. It's amazing how well the athletic directors work together and the principals work together to resolve issues. Um, and I, I'll give you one example. One of you, I think it's you, Senator Persick, mentioned the issue about students um, making sexual comments towards students on another, I think it was lacrosse, but it might've been soccer this fall. And we heard about that issue and we had heard a lot from one community about that issue and the other community did an investigation and they released a statement that they did not find harassment, which they didn't. But what they did find was inappropriate behavior and they took action against a whole bunch of kids. However, because those kids were all under 18, they couldn't share, you know, Joey Smith was, you know, banned from games the rest of the year, any of that stuff. And they can't share that with the other school either. We just happened to know that they did take strong action against several kids who were involved but it's not something that gets shared publicly. So oftentimes it's very similar to when a, when a school does a harassment investigation. If I find that somebody has committed harassment and I take action against them, I can't tell the other side anything other than I found harassment or I found inappropriate behavior, we've taken action. And parents also wanna know, well, what is that action? 
but legally school administrators can't share that. It's the same here. When students are participating in athletic events, they still have their FERPA protections. They still have their student record protections. Being a member of an athletic team um, is part of your student record, part of your permanent record. So schools are schools only have so much they can disclose when they take action. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mayor Hooker. Thank you. Uh, so, Strickles, what's the protocol now for playing <laughs> for participating in sports if you're not vaccinated? Can you part? I didn't hear the first part of the question. I apologize. What's, what's the protocol now? I mean, I understand that kids are are wearing masks while they're participating in sports, and there is no mandate for um, vaccines. So what's the protocol for kids who are not vaccinated? So <clears throat> if you're not vaccinated and you are, and this just changed uh, a little while ago. So if you really want to talk about this, you should, you should talk to Mark, uh, Dr. Levine, and he could explain it better. But my understanding is if you're not vaccinated and you don't have any symptoms, you know, you're wearing a mask, you're fine. If you're what would we used to call close contact and you're not having any symptoms, you wear the mask and you take, you get the antigen test. I think it's on the fourth day and the fifth day. And if they're both negative, you keep playing. If they're not negative, you have to go a certain period of time before you stop having symptoms before you can, before you can participate in school and thus sports again. If you're vaccinated, it's, it's a different standard. Um, although I think it's pretty close to the same thing now because it used to be you'd have to sit out like 10 days. Um, and they're, they're not doing that anymore with the change. We're not really doing close contacts like we were before. Okay, so th you're essentially doing the same thing that um, the schools are doing. There's oh, yeah, no, definitely. There's no added precaution for kids. Who the only added precaution we had early on, and this came, I apologize for the dogs, this came um, at, at my recommendation, and maybe uh, Dr. Lee and I had talked, and we had agreed, uh, and other people agreed with us, that if you were not vaccinated and you were a close contact and you didn't have any symptoms during that quarantine period, you could still go to school because a test to stay at school and you could still go to practices, but you could not play in games against other teams because we didn't want you to mix with kids from other teams. And that was like an incentive to tell kids get vaccinated. Um, but now with the changes and nobody really doing um, that level of test to test to stay anymore, where it's really the parent doing the antigen test. I think that's not as big an issue now. So if you're positive, you have to get cleared by your PCP, your your primary care physician, right? Has to say you're okay to play. But if you're not positive and you're masked up, even if you're what would be a close contact previously, you just would take the antigen test. And if it's negative, you keep going to school and you keep being able to participate in things. And are, are kids wearing N95s? Um, no, um, not, not everybody. I mean, I went to a game last night. Some kids were wearing, I think what were N95s or some kids were wearing uh, cloth masks. There's no, there's no rule about that. There's just recommendations. And the bottom line is as long as, long as they're wearing a mask. Um, I personally would love to see everybody wearing an N95 in school and in sports. It's interesting because a lot of states are not requiring masks in sports. I think we might be the only one that are requiring masks for playing. A lot of them are having the kids wearing them on the sidelines um, and the fans wear them. But when the kids actually on the hockey rink or on the um, basketball court, they're not wearing them. But in Vermont, we've, we're having the kids wear them. Any final questions for Mr. Nichols or any final question, comments from you, Jay? No, I just appreciate your time on this. And uh, we're, you know, we all have the same goals in mind. So yes, this, uh, we'll take a look at your testimony. Uh, we may have you back uh, if senators have additional questions or concerns, but really appreciate uh, your thoughts on both of them. And my only immediate request would be if you could give some thought to what are what would be the appropriate response if we were to say, give school districts, school boards a certain period of time um, to rethink their mascot, uh, what would happen if they just opted not to. And is, you know, I think it was Senator Hooker or Senator Lyons that posed the idea of maybe it does get punted to the state board, uh, you know, or sub, some subcommittee quickly. I mean, we're, we'd really be talking probably about one or two districts, but it seems to me that, that some follow up uh, is necessary. Otherwise, we might not get folks to do it. So 
you could give some thought to that and uh, that in the next few days. Uh, in the meantime, hope you're feeling better. And uh, thanks very much. Thank you all.